to uh, put an exclamation point on this exciting event today is our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Carrie Leroy. She is a freshwater ecologist with research expertise in aquatic terrestrial linkages and stream ecology. She has published over 60 peer reviewed articles, book chapters and books with people from all over the world. Being a scientist and traveling the world is so much fun for her. She loves sharing science with people of all ages, especially at beautiful sites like Mount St. Helens where she's been doing some research. Her favorite thing to do is to go hiking with her husband, her seventh grade daughter, and their two goofy dogs. Carrie, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Sheila. I'm going to share my screen. Um, oops, I think so, yes. And get this started. All right, everybody, it's so exciting to be here today. My name is Carrie Leroy, and I'm going to be talking about freshwater macroinvertebrates of the Pacific Northwest. Wait, no, I'm not. I'm going to talk about zombies, parasites, vampires, and other aquatic monsters. So, what's a zombie? Are you acting strangely? Are you doing things you wouldn't normally do? Are you willing to put yourself in danger? Well, there are lots of zombies in nature, actually. And so, for example, this little cricket here is doing normal crickety things, right? Like hopping around, eating grass. And then all of a sudden, it sees a pond of water. Now, would a normal cricket hop into the water? No, right? That would be acting strangely for a cricket. Crickets don't generally swim, but crickets that are infected with this giant nasty worm called a nematomorph or a horsehair worm actually do jump into the water. And the reason they do it is that the worm has to get into the water for its next life stage. So it hijacks the cricket's brain and it tells the cricket to seek out the nearest source of water and jump into it, which is really crazy. So there's more zombies in nature though. For example, there are zombie snails. This is the canab amber snail. It looks like a normal snail for the most part until it gets infected by this flat, flat worm called a trematode. And then all of a sudden, the, the worm migrates up into its eye stalks and starts pulsating like this. And it looks like, makes the eye stalks look like two little tasty worms. So the birds fly down and attack the snail and eat it. Um, ripping off on an eye stalk maybe in the process and then the worm gets into the bird because the bird is the next host for this trematode flatworm. So that's another zombie in nature. The other the crazy thing is that the worm causes the snail to crawl up out of the, um, the leaf litter on the edge of the stream and climb up onto the top of a plant where there are more birds that could attack it. So basically hijacking the snail's brain again. There are also what are called um, zombie scuds. So this is a spiny headed worm. Isn't it gross? Look at how, ugh, ugh, right? It's got this big spiny head. Well, it attacks something called a scud, which is a crustacean that lives in ponds and lakes. And so you can actually see right now in this picture of the scud, you can see the worm. It's that orange spot. And so it turns this um, scud bright orange. And normally scuds are like, they're like scra scavenging around on the bottom of the pond. But when they get infected by the spiny headed worm, they swim to the surface of the pond and they start splashing around at the surface. Again, this, this worm is causing the scud to do something it wouldn't normally do, putting itself in danger because at the surface, it's then available to be eaten by ducks and other birds. And so basically the birds and the fish then prey on, this, on the scud and the spiny headed worm gets into its next host. So these are parasites, but um, they create zombies in nature. So they infect their host. They alter the host's body shape and or behavior. Then the behavior benefits the parasite and it usually results in the undead, right? Or the dead in this case. Uh, and the parasite then goes on to living in a new host. These stories are really common in nature and they're, they're some of the most fun stories to talk about. 
So what about some other uh, monsters in nature? Here's a freshwater mussel that actually puts on a costume um, and makes itself look like, look like a fish. Do you see that, that fish in the picture? That's actually a piece of muscle tissue that extends out of the muscle and flaps around and looks like a fish. Some of these muscle lures, they're called lures because they lure, um, they lure somebody in toward the muscle because right, the muscle can't move. So it creates this fleshy appendage that like swims around and some of them even gulp air. And when the muscle moves the tissue, it looks like a fish swimming and gulping air. And it looks like a little fish. And what it does is it attracts bigger fish that come and try to eat the little fish, the lure. But why? Why would a muscle want a fish to come and try to eat it? That doesn't seem right. Well, this is not a parasite situation. It actually benefits the muscle. And so these mild-mannered mussels, you thought of them as just like sitting on the bottom of the stream, cleaning the water, right? Well, actually, they produce vampire babies. Did you know that? So these are mussel babies. They're called glochidia, and they're little tiny mussels, and they pinch, right? And they pinch onto the gills of fish. And so what's happening is the muscle produces a lure to attract a bigger fish. And when the big fish comes close, it releases millions of tiny babies into the water. And the glochidia, the little babies, clamp onto the gills of the big fish. And then they suck the fish's blood. Did you know that mussels were blood suckers? Just like vampires, right? Well, the reason they do this is that mussels can't move. So how would mussels get their, their babies upstream um, to, you know, grow into adult mussels. If they didn't somehow attach to fish to swim upstream, all the mussel babies would float downstream and even they'd end up in the ocean. So this is a really interesting adaptation to getting mussel babies back upstream. Okay, what about some other blood suckers? Some other vampires in nature, right? Some of these are going to be familiar to you. Uh, these are some leeches on a rainbow trout on some fish. I think that's a rainbow trout. Anyway, leeches like to attach to fish and they're sucking blood. They're parasites. Here you can see um, a mama and papa leech um, carrying their young around. So they provide paternal care. They're not all bad, right? They're not all, all vicious blood suckers. They're actually caring parents. Um, but there are other blood suckers in nature, things like mosquitoes, right? We've probably all been bitten by mosquitoes. Well, did you know that if you've been bitten by a mosquito, you can guarantee it was a female mosquito. Males don't bite. Here's some mosquitoes when they live underwater. This is what their larvae look like. They're really kind of cool. And they hang from the surface of the water um, because they're breathing out of a tube on the, the end. This is a black fly uh, adult. Black flies are a little bit worse than mosquitoes, I think, because they have these mouth parts that are like circular saw blades and they land on your skin and then they cut you open and then they lap up your blood. Ooh, uh, they're pretty gross, but they have really cool looking larvae. These larvae are filter feeders and they have what's called a cephalic fan that comes out of their head to trap little particles of material as it's flowing downstream. So they have really cool larvae too. Okay, the last one, maybe you haven't seen these guys. These are giant water bugs. Um, they're, they're true bugs. So it's the one type of insect we can call a true bug in the order Hemiptera. And they have piercing sucking mouth parts. Well, these bugs can take on prey that you might not guess. So things like uh, fish, here's one eating a fish, snakes, and frogs. So these giant water bugs basically suck the life out of these, um, these amazing aquatic organisms. So there's some more vampires for you. Nature's vampires, blood is a very nutritious meal. And so it's required for things like mosquitoes to lay eggs. And that's why only female mosquitoes need a blood meal. Um, they need that extra protein to make their eggs. Baby mussels feed on fish blood while they hitch a ride upstream. And giant water bugs are just big, nasty predators that suck the life out of their prey. 
Okay, what about some other aquatic monsters? Uh, oh, you might look at this and think, how is that an aquatic monster? That's a beautiful damselfly. Well, as adults, they're voracious predators and they can eat almost anything when they're flying around ponds and streams. But you might not know what they look like as larvae, or maybe you do, because you've all been studying your water quality. So here's a nice aquatic damselfly larva, but underneath it has a jaw that can extend out like that, Ooh! and it can eat all kinds of really big aquatic insects. So there's that jaw sticking out of the, um, of the larvae. Now a dragonfly has the same jaw. Look at the jaw on that one. These are the stuff of nightmares, these jaws, people. Oh, it's very scary. All right, and what about this guy? This is called a mega lopterin. Mega meaning big, right? Big wings, big mandibles, big jaws. Oh my gosh, these guys are massive predators, both as larvae, the one in the bottom left, and as adults um, on the right. Really big aquatic insects. So aquatic monsters, things like dragonflies and damselflies are very scary, voracious predators. And in fact, going back through the fossil record, we know that, that sometimes they, can, they could have had wingspans as big as like three to four feet. So there used to be really giant dragonflies on earth. There's larvae, they have extendable lower jaws. And Dobson flies or Helgramites have giant mandibles, both as larvae and adults. Really kind of scary, but cool, right? So now you know a little bit more about zombies, vampires, and other monsters just living below the rocks in your local stream. So get out there and look for them. Uh, you'll find all kinds of really cool bugs. So I think maybe you've seen this before. I just wanna shout out to one of my evergreen students of the past, Claire Miller, who drew all of these amazing aquatic macroinvertebrates as part of her, um, her schoolwork at Evergreen. And you're gonna to get to hear from three other Evergreen students in sequence. So some college student voices. Usually you get to come to campus um, to Evergreen and we love hosting the annual Green Congress. And some of my students get to volunteer to help with workshops and things like that. So today we're just gonna hear from my three students who are going to turn on their cameras. I'm gonna turn mine off in sequence. So first you're gonna hear from uh, Brandy. Brandy, are you there? Yes, I, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, it looks great, sounds great. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brandy Kamakaviva Ole. Um, I am a senior at, at the Evergreen State College. And one reason why I decided to earn my Bachelor of Science degree from Evergreen uh, is because of the close ties that this college has to the Native American tribes of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is my poster. Um, the macroinvertebrate I chose to research about uh, was in the order Ephemeroptera and family Ephemeralidae. And they're commonly uh, known as spiny crawler mayflies. And uh, one interesting thing that I found was when confronted by a stonefly predator, um, individuals in this family performed a scorpion pose um, where they folded their cerci over their back, uh, kind of like a, how a scorpion arches its tail when it's ready to attack. And this makes it look too big and too spiny to eat. Um, and in the same study, uh, re researchers found that uh, the smaller earlier instars uh, would not use this scorpion pose uh, because if they did, they would look like the perfect size to eat. And so I had a lot of fun putting this uh, poster together and thank you for having us here. Oops. Great, the next uh, student is Lynn. Can you turn your camera on, Lynn? 
Do you see me? Yes. Okay. I don't see myself. <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter, but you can hear me. There we go. Hi, everybody. I'm Lynn Givler. Um, I actually went to Evergreen in the 1970s, graduated in 1977. Um, I am coming back now on what is called a senior waiver because I'm 67 years old. I'm allowed to get greatly reduced tuition to take this class, which I really appreciate. So if you have grandparents or older friends that want to do some late learning in life, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I live in the Fraser River watershed. The Fraser River runs through Canada. So I'm up in Whatcom County and able to take this class because of it being remote, which I really appreciate. So where we live, um, we're in a forested hillside and we have a pond, which shows up in the poster here. I did some dipping in the pond and the photo below the pond shows a caddisfly nymphs, or excuse me, caddisfly larvas case. So the caddisfly, many of them are what are called shredders. They cut apart leaves um, that have fallen into the pond or stream and they eat them and they eat the bacteria and the fungus that grow on them also. This particular family, the lim limnophilidae, um, are called the northern caddisflies. And something I found really interesting about them is their relationship with another species that lives in our pond, the rough skin newt, which is a kind of salamander. And the rough skin newt is among the most toxic of vertebrates that exist. So their skin, if we were to eat one, it would kill us. And their eggs are also toxic. But amazingly, um, certain species of northern caddisfly larva can eat them, derive the protein and the fats that they get from them, but it somehow does not hurt them. So this is one of the mysteries of nature. They have not actually figured out exactly why this particular larva is able to, to process that toxin. So anyway, that's sort of it in a nutshell. And I'm really happy to be able to join you and uh, looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. And the last student is um, Marisa Fisher. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Marisa Fisher. I am also a graduating senior at the Evergreen State College. Um, I have really loved my time at Evergreen in part because the science program is really incredible. Um, and you have a lot of opportunities there for undergraduate research um, and really getting your hands dirty um, that you might not have at a lot of other larger institutions. Um, and we're right here in the Northwest, so you've got access to all of the watersheds that you've been studying, as well as uh, the forests and the mountains and, and everything is right outside your back door. Um, so I did this poster, this research project on freshwater mussels of the Pacific Northwest. Um, you heard Carrie talking a little bit about how they're little vampires, um, but they're, they're vulnerable vampires. They're actually very, very endangered. Freshwater mussels are the most endangered animals, um, category of animals um, in North America. The Center for Biological Diversity says um, there are 890 known species of freshwater mussels. Um, 302 of them are accounted for in North America, but here in the Pacific Northwest, there are only seven identified species that are native to our Pacific Northwest waters. Um, they're really important to our ecosystems. Um, they're considered ecosystem engineers because of the different environmental services that they provide to their ecosystems. Um, we learned a little bit about how they, you know, take in water earlier. They're filter feeders, so they um, are really important for water clarity in the streams. Um, and if they're vulnerable, if they their population is decreasing, then your opportunity for biofiltration nit and nitrogen and phosphorus uptake um, to keep your stream water quality good um, goes way, way down. Um, some of the reasons that they're at risk or vulnerable here have to do with decreasing water quality, which I'm sure you've been learning about over the course of this past week. 
Um, as well as, as you learned, those little glaucidia are really dependent on fish populations. Um, so when we have things that are affecting our salmonid populations, or our fish populations in our streams and rivers, that really um, impacts, it really impacts the freshwater mussel populations as well, because if they can't hitch a ride, um, then they're not getting anywhere and their population is not going to thrive. Um, so they're really important. Um, there's lots of organizations locally in here in the Pacific Northwest that you can check out if you're interested. Um, including the Pacific Northwest Native Freshwater Muscle Work Group and the Xerxes Society, um, who have actually put together the petition for putting one of those species on the endangered species list um, just in the last year or so. We'll see how that goes. Thanks for your time. Great, thank you. I'm going to invite all of my students to turn their cameras on. And I'm gonna invite all of you in the audience to ask us a couple questions. I'm gonna let the Nisqually folks um, tell us when to stop, but uh, throw your questions in the Q&A. We wanna hear from you and we wanna answer your questions. Um, so Here, we already have quite a few questions that have been coming in as you've been talking. So should we get started with some that are already um, been submitted? Okay, so one of the questions was, um, you remember what that slide that you showed with the muscle and it had like an appendage that looked like a fake fish. So somebody was asking, are they born with that or do they grow it? How does that happen? Oh, that's such a great question. I mean, it's so weird too. There's some really awesome videos you can watch that show the fish, the fish lure in action. Um, so it's something that they're born with. It's, um, I mean, it's part of their genetic makeup to produce this lure, but mussels don't have eyeballs, right? How do they even know what a fish looks like, right? Because millions of years of evolution led the mussels that had little bits of skin that looked like fish to survive and rep reproduce more offspring, their offspring did better. That's how evolution works, folks. So millions of years where fishy looking lures led to more offspring that led to more of those babies that produced fishy looking lures. And it's one of the most amazing stories of evolution that I know of because mussels don't even know what fish look like. Marisa, do you wanna add anything? Um, I, the only thing that I would add is that it is important to know that the, for those fit or for those muscles, um, it's only the females that have that because they're the only ones who need that ability to get the fish to come close so that the babies can hitch a ride. Awesome. Thanks for adding that. Other questions. So Jaden was wondering, I think maybe she was a little nervous about that giant water bug. Do those live in the U S? They certainly do. Um, I, I saw a lot of them when I lived in the Southwest. Have, have any of my students, have you run across? I don't think, uh, I haven't seen one in our region, but I think they do exist. I don't think they get quite as big. Let me tell you one little cool thing about them. In the desert Southwest, they can sense the rumbles in the earth that tell them that a flash flood is coming. So if you're ever hanging out by a desert stream and all the giant water bugs start running out of the water, you should get up and run yourselves because they know when a flash flood is coming. That is so cool. Um, what about the megaloptera flies? Where can you find those? Those you can find all over, although their populations have been um, devastated by bait fishermen. So the helgramite, the, um, the really big larva, they were really popular as bait, and so they've been over harvested. So their populations are much lower than they would be. Um, I, again, I've seen them more frequently as a, the big adults in the, in the Southwest too, but, um, but I know we have helgramites here. Sounds like the Southwest is the place to go for the really giant, nasty <laughs> looking things. Um, I know something that we do have here are dragonflies and damselflies. So what's the main difference between those two? Do any of my students want to answer that question? I'll take a stab. So the damselfly, well, as adults, they tend to land with their wings held behind them, right, Carrie? Yes. And the dragonflies keep their wings out. And as 
larvae, um, the damselfly at the end of their abdomen have three sort of tails that are gills, whereas the dragonfly is more truncated, more cut off. Um, and the dragonflies are bigger in general. Yeah. Dragonfly larvae, their gills are internal. So they need to draw water in and then boosh it out really fast. So they can actually move using jet propulsion underwater if they pull a lot of water in and push it out really fast. Are there any other species that have that extendable jaw? Like, No, not really. That is something that the dragonflies and damselflies um, have special. So the other question is, <clears throat> I'm not sure which, which um, particular critter this was in relation to, but I was asking if they eat leaves, why don't they just live on the land? Oh, that is a great question. Do any of my students want to try to tackle that? I can do it. Brandy, do you want to try to tackle that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, not sure. <laughs> I, I think that uh, that's a pretty complex question. So why, why would they have their larvae live underwater at all, right? And I think partly it has to do with the fact that um, diversity and biomass is so much higher in streams than it is in the air or, on, or even on land. So if you want to see the most different and most abundant organisms on earth, you should go to a freshwater environment because you can just look in and see fish swimming around and you can see you pick up a rock and there's going to be bugs all over it. You know, like that's not quite as common in the air. And so um, if you have an adult stage that zooming around the atmosphere, it wouldn't be very effective um, or productive to have your larvae also um, in the air. And so they make this important transition from the water to the land. I think because of resources, there's lots of resources in the water. And then once they can fly, of course, they can buzz around and get lots of, I think that might be my best guess. Um, also in the aquatic system, um, things like bacteria and fungi are not limited by water. And so they grow really fast. And so um, on a leaf, you have much faster decomposition and microbial growth in, a, in the water than you do on land. That's really interesting. It's amazing that whole aquatic ecosystem. Um, somebody was asking about species of newts. I know I've seen that one that you that you showed. Are there other species of newts, especially in like our area? There are lots of species of newts. I'm not an expert in newts. I know Lynn, you studied um, the rough-skinned newt, but um, I we have we have quite a few newts. I can't rattle off all of their names, but yeah, we have lots of different species of frogs and salamanders and newts and toads. Um, lots of amphibians in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, here's a question for maybe for some of the students. Maybe you guys, maybe one of the students can take this one. Um, <clears throat> if someone ate a zombie cricket or snail, would they turn into a zombie? Somebody want it? You're all laughing. Such a great- I would say it's inevitable. <laughs> I Not, think that, sorry, Lynn, go ahead. Okay, Marisa. I was gonna say, I think that probably has to do with what your, what your, uh, what canon you subscribe to around zombies. <laughs> um, but as far as an actual biological answer is concerned, no, humans would not respond in the same way um, to that kind of parasitism as these other organisms do. That's right. We don't we don't know what kinds of things might be infecting us and changing our behaviors. You know, our microbiome is quite complex and there are some theories that the microbes that colonize your body um, are influencing your behaviors and actions. Um, but there's not a lot of hard evidence about that. So don't be worried yet. Um, but it is interesting to think of our bodies as basically just like big sacks of bacteria. Right. Who are you really? 
I like that word that you used microbiome because that's such it makes you think about the whole world within your own body. Um, <clears throat> somebody was asking, <clears throat> and this is probably a question for you, Carrie, about the Evergreen State College. Um, could you tell us a little bit about when it was built or founded or, you know, some just a quick little background about Evergreen? Sure, I can. Evergreen is a really neat place. And I think because it's our, one of our local colleges, people don't always know all the details. Um, so in the 19, the late 1960s, and actually Lynn can talk about this because she was a student there um, or pretty early, it was established as a big experiment to basically say, well, um, we, we kind of know what colleges are like, but let's build one that's totally unlike any other college. Um, where we don't have, you know, strict disciplines where you have to study, you have to decide you're going to study biology and you can't study other things, you know. Um, and so at the time, a bunch of experiments were established, but Evergreen is one of the only um, of those original experiments that still exists today. And some of the most beautiful things about Evergreen, um, in my opinion, is that you can, you can build your own path, you can study what you want. Um, that we don't give you a grade at the end of the quarter, like, oh, great, you know, you spent 10 weeks studying this thing and you get a B, right? You actually get this very rich letter written by your faculty member that talks about the work that you did across the board, um, which is a much better expression of what you've learned. Um, and yeah, what, what other things about Evergreen um, would the students add? I would just add on to the last um, thing that you just said about the narrative evaluations. Um, I think they get a bad rap and I really as a student appreciate so much the time that my faculty take to write those. Um, it reads like a reference letter. You have exactly an idea of, you know, where your strengths are, where you might, you know, could use a little bit more attention if it's something that you want to focus on and where your skills are. Um, and there are documents that you get to take with you um, in a way that you don't with a B plus or, or that kind of grade. Um, and I really value that. I like having a file of all those things on hand. Yeah. We have about four minutes left and we have um, quite a few more questions. So I'm thinking we'll ask as many as we can. And then is it okay if we forward the rest of the questions that we don't get to to you and maybe we can share the responses? Yeah, yeah, either, yeah, you can forward them and then um, I can, we can respond and send them back. Okay. One uh, of the questions is particular, is in particular for Marisa, and it is um, asking about when you said there were hundreds of species of mussels around the world, but only seven are native to this region. So where are the majority of mussel species found? That's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer. It would be a great further research question for the global distribution of those mussel species, but about a third of them are in North America. Um, so about a third of, of the total global species are found in North America, and they're most concentrated in the southeast. Um, so in the Tennessee River and the Mobile River basins in the southeast of the U.S., um, you can find the highest concentration of freshwater mussels, you know, around the world. Great, that's awesome. Um, we've also, a lot of these students have been studying uh, water quality and um, we're wondering about if these water bugs require the same optimal water quality standards as salmon, for example. Anybody wanna take that one? I would say um, generally, yes. However, some of the um, organisms that we talked about, things like leeches and, and like aquatic earthworms, um, they can tolerate much worse conditions than salmon. Um, and so a lot, oftentimes people use aquatic insects as what are called bioindicators of um, overall ecosystem health. So if you go to a stream and all you find are a bunch of leeches and worms, then basically that stream might not support salmon. But if you go to a stream and you find stoneflies and caddisflies and mayflies, then you've got a stream that's gonna support salmon. So some of those organisms have the same habitat requirements and so can be used as indicators. Even if you don't see fish that day, you know that fish probably would like it there. 
And I think we'll talk at the end of this about some opportunities where, where you in the classroom can learn more about those water quality connections. So we'll follow up with that later. Um, what about, are there any of these insects that you featured or others that you know of that are really dangerous to humans? Uh, several of my <clears throat> students did research on mosquitoes because of their um, capacity to carry diseases as vectors. Um, so they, they aren't dangerous themselves, but sometimes they carry parasites that can give you diseases like malaria and schistosomiasis and river blindness. So yes, I would say some aquatic insects are dangerous, but not because they are dangerous to humans, but their parasites are dangerous to humans for the most part. Okay, and I think we have one one more question, and then um, you know, you folks, if if you want, you can feel free to answer them right in the Q and A if you would like to. Um, what would happen if a crayfish and a fishing spider went to battle? What do you think? Oh, good one. I, I think the crayfish would probably win out. You crayfish can get really big, and um, they're pretty pinchy. Uh, personally, I think I think we should have a, a March Madness like you know battle for uh, aquatic insects. But I, I'd put my bets on the crayfish. What do you What do your students say? Would you say something different? All right, they're all agreeing with me. Okay, so yeah, my students and I will try to answer some of your awesome questions in the Q and A. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really fun, and thanks to my students for doing such a great job. Thank you. Can we give every give them a round of applause wherever you are? Nice job, you guys. Everybody, this was wonderful. <laughs>